it is my pleasure to start off uh, the new, the new uh, you know, round of QCMFP webinars in the new academic year. Hopefully you had a nice summer. And uh, the first speaker uh, of this academic year will be Seth Lovett from the University of Sheffield. And he is going to uh, discuss the observation of Zeta Bewegung effect in optical microcavity. So Seth, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, as Patrick said, I'm a, um, my name's Seth Lover. I'm from the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm in the early stages of my postdoctorate. Um, and this is uh, some of the work that we did, I did um, towards the end of my PhD um, uh, on the zitter Bewegung effect in uh, optical microcavities. Um, and I was heavily supported, uh, well, in, in terms of the uh, theory side um, by uh, Dr. Paul Walker, um, my supervisor, Dimitri here. Um, and then um, some of the simulations were run by our colleagues at ITMO University, um, uh, namely Alexei Osipov and uh, Alexei uh, Yulin. Um, and this work was uh, funded by uh, the UKRI uh, and Research Council. Um, so, I mean, the natural start is to um, discuss the Zitter Bewegung effects origins um, and uh, what it is. So, if you recognize this person here, this is Schrodinger, and he was actually the first person that uh, predicted and named this effect. In this paper here in uh, 1930, um, and what he uh, predicted was that for, um, well, he predicted it for relativistic free electrons, but um, more generally, it's for any particle that is governed by the uh, Dirac equation um, that you can see down here. And this prediction arose when he realized that the, um, the relativistic velocity operators don't commute with the Hamiltonian. Um, so specifically in a relativistic free electron case uh, for him. Um, and what this implies is that this velocity isn't a constant of motion. Um, so that you have your, your, your sort of classical um, velocity in the expected direction, but then you have this um, sort of quantum, um, a velocity with a quantum origin uh, manifesting as a periodic oscillations transverse to the propagation direction. So if you've got a particle propagating in the y direction, you expect these periodic oscillations in the x direction. So it's quite counterintuitive. Um, this is sort of where it uh, it came from. Um, and if we sort of hone in on the effect um, more, uh, there's, there's several interpretations of this effect. Um, Schrodinger sort of framed it as this interference between the positive and negative uh, energy states of the relativistic free electrons, so the positron and the electron state. There's also some uh, interpretations as it being some sort of interaction between um, vacuum electron positron uh, pairs. Um, but more importantly, it's extremely experimentally inaccessible. Um, so this is, it was all on paper, but there was sort of never any expectation to be able to observe this. And it's due to the high frequency and low amplitude of these oscillations. So in the uh, relativistic free electron case, we have a predicted frequency of um, 2.5 uh, times 10 to the 20 Hertz, and the predicted amplitude of four times 10 to the minus 13 meters. So that's not something we would ever hope to observe, certainly not with uh, the technology in most labs. Um, but it did sort of, um, lead to this idea that there may be some analogous systems in which we can observe this effect. Um, and that then sort of spurred on a search for these analogous systems, which I will um, cover now. So when we want to search for this analogous system, it's important we understand um, what ingredients we need in a system for the sitter pervading effect to be present. It's not, you know, we can't just have it in any old system. Um, so the first and most important system uh, ingredient is that this system must have two or more split energy bands um, and also a spin degree of freedom. Um, and that spin must be coupled to some form of magnetic field vector. Um, and that will typically arise from this, these spin split energy bands. Um, and that magnetic field vector must also depend on the momentum. So taking all those, you can sort of 
create a Hamiltonian with those properties. And we'll break that Hamiltonian down on the next slide. So uh, we have the Hamiltonian we just showed there, and it's this form of Hamiltonian that we expect to observe this um, Zitterbewegung effect. Um, you have this, uh, energy that's dependent on the momentum here, but most importantly, you have this magnetic field vector or pseudo-magnetic field vector here in omega, and that's coupled to the spin of the um, particles in the system. And that spin is just, in this case, a um, vector of matrices. So this is really the sort of golden ingredient. If we have a system with this Hamiltonian, then we expect Zitterbewegung to be present um, in that system. Um, how or um, in which way you'd observe that is a different matter. But um, examples of these systems um, were sort of collated together um, in this paper here. Um, and all they did was look for systems with a Hamiltonian of that form. Um, so they say, you know, there's a rashford dressel house system, um, single layer graphene, and nearly free electrons. Um, but the problem with a lot of these is that it still leads to um, either extremely hard to observe, you know, it's, it's inaccessible to observe the um, sort of wave function of the particles and see these oscillations are present, or we're talking about frequencies and amplitudes um, of, again, of high frequency, low amplitude observations, uh, sorry, oscillations. So there are analogous systems out there, but they still only really um, exist on paper. There were some experimental measurements done, so this is perhaps um, one of the, one of the um, sort of closest to directly observe, observing it. It's a trapped ion simulator, uh, trapped ion quantum simulation, where they um, did it, this simulation of the Dirac equation, so that this uh, ion, this trapped ion, behaves as a relativistic particle. And when they looked looked over time, um, they saw these oscillations start to form. Um, in the propagation path of the, these trapped ions. Um, but again, these were indirect observations. Um, they weren't necessarily easy to obtain. Um, and there was also some work done with, in sort of the field of optics, which is more relevant to our work um, in terms of coupled waveguides. Um, there were some um, propagating modes within those waveguides and through fluorescent uh, observations, they saw some sort of transverse oscillations, but they were hesitant to say whether it was Zitterbewegung or whether it was some sort of in-plane potential acting on the particles. But there was also a sort of, um, you know, near observation of Zitterbewegung there as well. But, you know, th th there's no absolute confirmation um, with relatively easy um uh, observations of this effect in an analogous system, especially in optics. Um, so this naturally leads me to talk about our work, um, and it's using microcavity micro polaritons uh, as an analogous system, um, so an analogous uh, to create this sort of analog for this high energy physics. Um, so for those that don't know, I'll um, talk about these microcavity polaritons now and just give a brief overview. Of what they are. So a microcavity essentially is an optical resonator and you have these stacks of uh, materials with alternating refractive indexes, indices, uh, above and below a cavity uh, layer here. So this, this might be aluminium gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide, aluminium gallium arsenide again, and then you might have a gallium arsenide core here. Um, and essentially what that allows is a mode to be confined within this cavity here. So it will penetrate some depth within these Bragg mirrors, but eventually it will be reflected back and it repeats down at the bottom as well. Um, so these uh, DBR stacks have an extremely high reflectivity. Um, so we can confine our modes within these structures, um, but we can also then add quantum wells. So it's typically an exotonic material of some sort. Um, in this cavity here, so that you see sort of this, if you call it collision between the photonic mode and the, the um, electrons in the quantum wells, or um, you know some sort of interaction between the two. But you 
that essentially acts to hybridize the light and the matter. So the system would look like a mode coming down. It would excite an electron to form an exciton that would eventually recombine. And um, that mode would then be uh, released and free to propagate again. Reflection occurs again. And that entire transfer of energy is what leads to this, uh, what we call a, a polariton, this quasi-particle. Um, and eventually you will get some leakage through these DBR layers of the photonic mode um, via tunneling. And I'll talk about why that's important shortly, but that is how we create these quasi-particles. And that is a brief overview of, of their formation. But um, one of the signatures of these, these um, polaritons is you get this two banded uh, dispersion. So you have this exotonic um, flat dispersion uh, here, but you also get this um, photonic uh, parabolic dispersion and you get this two sort of band dispersion. Sorry, I've just put that in the way there. Now you get this, This yes, that's a bit better. You get this um, photonic parabolic dispersion here and this flat exotonic dispersion here. And the combination of those is these upper and lower polariton branch. Um, and this is what we call strong coupling when you get this anti-crossing behavior. And it's essentially new, a new uh, eigenstates of this system um, when you have this energy transfer at a su sufficient rate. Um, and then here's just a little schematic showing it in a more um, sim simplified view um, to give you an idea of what it is. So just to note, um, the lower down on this, this lower branch here you go. So if you're right at the bottom here, the more photonic your particles are, so the more time um, they spend as a photon or photonic mode. And then the closer to this exciton resonance here, the more exotonic they are. So if you follow the momentum over... Um, you get a varying degree of, of each component. Um, and then it's inverse for the upper polariton branch. But we focus on the lower polariton branch in this work. Um, and what's interesting about these particles is they exhibit properties of both components. So for the exotonic component, they exhibit interparticle interactions um, through the exchange interaction. Uh, they also have an external magnetic field response. Um, but then they inherit a very low effective mass from the photonic component along with a long range propagation um, and also spin orbit coupling effects, which we'll talk about shortly because that's really what underpins this, this system of Agon work. Um, but I'll just sort of talk about why we sort of want to use micro-cavity uh, polaritons or you know, what sort of gave us the um, idea to use these initially. Uh, and I'll also cover that a bit more later. But um, one of the important things is we have this you know, relative ease of access to the wave function. And that's by this photon tunneling that I talked about earlier. Um, so eventually you get this tunneling of the photons through the DBR stacks, and then you can just analyze those photons because they carry the um, momentum information and they carry the uh, energy of the, the states. You can analyze that using photoluminescence uh, spectroscopy, which is um, relatively simple. Um, so there's no indirect measurements needed. You can also tune the detuning, probably should have phrased that better, but essentially what that means is you can vary the photon and exciton um, component of these particles. So if you, like we do in this work, we wanted to keep it simple, we wanted to ignore any um, interparticle interactions just so we could establish this effect initially, we, we use highly photonic um, polaritons, sort of lost my mouse. But if you wanted to see how uh, interparticle interactions and get a nonlinear response in the system, you would use uh, more exotonic um, polaritons. Um, and again, because of these exotonic, um, the fact you can vary this exciton photon content, it allows us the potential for further work uh, via nonlinear effects and magnetic response. And that goes for a lot of polaritonic experiments as well. Um, and I'll just give a brief overview of some of the work that um, has been done or is being done with micro-cavity polaritons now, and just to give you an idea of the sort of the field, for those that don't know. So one of the major sort of interests is the fact that because these particles have a, a bosonic nature, um, they're expected to undergo this um, Bose-Einstein condensation, similar to um, boson, the typical bosons. Um, and that's where they m m macroscopically occupy some state on that polariton dispersion, typically the uh, lowest state on the lower polariton branch. Um, 
then closely linked to that is polariton laser. So when they're occupying this state, you expect some um, a mass amount of emission from a single state, and we call that a polariton laser. That's also of great interest because there's no population inversion involved, um, and it's quite a low threshold uh, compared to a typical laser as well. Um, there's also been observations of, of uh, solitons, um, in part due to the nonlinear effect um, that are given by these polaritons. So there's nonlinear effects will balance out the dispersive effects and you get these sort of self-localized propagating wave packets. Um, topological states, there's great interest in topological um, states at the moment with it, with polaritonic systems. Um, sort of a key milestone was um, the observation of edge states in honeycomb lattices. Um, and that they were observed to be unidirectional um, without any sort of effects due to um, defects in the in the lattice and no backscattering and they were observed to go around sort of right angle edges of the lattice as well so that's got great interest for uh, on-chip circuits and um, lossless um, propagation. Um, there's obviously analog gravity so that's something we're working on at the moment um, I know some people here know about that, but um, the idea that we can use um, the fact that these polariton uh, condensates have a sort of superfluid nature, um, you can create um, elementary uh, excitations within that to simulate particles in some sort of a, a quantum space-time environment. Um, and also the, the lossy nature of microcavities, or the fact you can um, create an inbuilt defect it means you can simulate to flat black holes through um, sort of bathtub models where the polaritons leak out of a hole and then more polaritons are sucked in um, or more polariton fluid is sucked in. And then finally, there's optical spin hall effects. Um, and that's that's what underpins this iterative vagan effect, which is why I've left that till last. Um, essentially, you, you create this spin orbit um, coupling um, where the magnetic field couples to a, a pseudo spin in this case, or polarization of the light. But the optical spin hall effect was a significant milestone in that um, because it really demonstrated how um, the spin orbit coupling in these systems is significant. Um, and it led to these observations of spin currents um, and sort of polarization domains. And also, really, is what led to the notion that Zitterbergen may be present in um, polariton systems as well with sufficient spin orbit coupling. Um, so I'll talk about that spin orbit coupling now, um, and we call it um, TETM splitting, so transverse electric, transverse magnetic splitting. Um, and then it arises, if we remember, we talked about that uh, sort of penetration into the DBR stacks above and below the cavity of the um, microcavity. What it actually goes a step further and you see this polarization dependent tunneling. Um, so if you've got a TE mode, it tunnels maybe slightly, uh, sorry, it penetrates slightly deeper before being fully reflected or if you've got TM mode. It introduces a phase delay between these orthogonally polarized modes. Uh, and when you look at the dispersion, you see two distinct um, branches. You see a TM branch and you see a TE branch, um, as you can see here. So the red branch is a TE branch, uh, the blue branch is a TM branch. Um, and they have slightly different curvature, which implies slightly different effective mass. And the origins of this, again, are because of this, this delay, this uh, polarization dependent tunneling and this phase delay. Um, but most importantly, is you can model this TE-TM splitting as an effective magnetic field that couples to the polarization or the pseudo spin of the polaritons. Now, that seems quite familiar what we talked about was one of the main ingredients for Zitterber Vega. Um, so let's see if we can turn the Hamiltonian from my poverty polariton into the Hamiltonian that we, we want to see. So this is a typical Hamiltonian um, from my cavity polariton. We have this um, single particle energy contribution here. You, you then have this contributions due to TETM splitting this second and third term here. Um, and if we model those second and third terms as a magnetic field so you've got no magnetic field out of the plane that's why it's zero but you have this magnetic field like this and in the x and y directions 
you can create a Hamiltonian that looks like this with this this energy dependent on the momentum, so the, the wave vector, and this coupling between the um, magnetic field vector and the spin or the polarization in the case of this system, the pseudo spin. Um, so that was when you know it, it kind of becomes obvious that this system would support um, Zitter Bewegung, and it was um, explored by uh, Isedov et al. in 2018. Um, they took this Hamiltonian and they considered its evolution, evolution over space, um, theoretically. And what they saw was these oscillations in the propagation path of um, these polaritons here. So if it's propagating in Y, they saw oscillations in X. And that's, you know, they, they, they went as far as say this, this is this vagrant, it has all the hallmarks and the ingredients for it. Um, and they also um, predicted that the period of these oscillations would be inversely dependent on the energy splitting between the TETM states. So if we go back a couple of slides just to show you that, it's not a super obvious, but the states, say, up here, a uh, higher wave vector, have a larger splitting between them than the states down here. Um, so if we were to observe polaritons within these states propagating, we would expect to see a smaller um, period of oscillation in the city of England and a large oscillation, a period of oscillation for states down here. Um, and that inverse, um, inversely proportional relationship is important because it allows a sort of benchmark for us. If we see oscillations, we could you know, sort of test it against that. And if we do, then it goes further to confirm it for us. Um, so I sort of covered the, the background. Um, obviously, um, I talked about some of the analog systems, why uh, microgravity polaritons sort of suit that um, analog system, uh, fulfilling that role as an analog system, um, kind of touched on where the effect would arise from in that system. Um, so now I'll sort of talk about the experiment we actually did and the results we got. Um, so the first thing for me to sort of talk about briefly is the sample and its properties, our specific sample. So we have a microgravity sample with EBR stacks created between alternating layers of gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide. I don't know if you can see them, but there is slight contrast between the layers here, um, above and below. And then we have this cavity layer here made of gallium arsenide with three quantum wells in it. Um, and it's also got a very negative detuning. So the polaritons are extremely photonic. They're almost 90, about 98, 99% photonic. So we call them polaritons, but they're essentially photons. But we did this because we wanted to be able to sort of ignore any nonlinear effects. We want to keep it nice and simple. And, you know, we want to see this with Aegon rather than this with Aegon with the addition of nonlinear effects involved. So we're using highly photonic um, polaritons here. And in our sample, we have two sources of splitting. So we have this TETM splitting that we've already discussed. Um, and that is uh, the, the magnitude of that splitting is dependent on the or proportional to the um, square of the wave vector. So that gives you that parabolic um, sort of dispersion and at higher wave vectors, you expect a larger splitting. Lower wave vectors, you expect a lower splitting. Um, but we also have what we call birefringent splitting. Um, this wasn't something we expected, but then we kind of realized from our experiments is birefringent splitting present. So we had to accommodate for that in our um, measurements and our results and simulations. Um, and that essentially is a simple way to think of it is you have polaritons propagating in one direction, orthogonal to that, um, they, they will be a different refractive index um, and they will propagate slightly differently. And the polar, polar, if the polarization of those polaritons is aligned with what we call the crystal slow axis or the crystal fast, fast axis, it will have a different energy compared to uh, polaritons um, propagating that direction with a polarization not aligned with either of those axes. And I'll show you, it become clear on the next slide. Um, so yeah, these are the fast and slow axes, as you see here. So the fast axis is X apostrophe and the slow axis is Y apostrophe. Um, and we define our propagation direction as Y and X. Um, and we, we define two orientations. Um, we define orientation one, and that's where the propagation direction is aligned with the fast, fast axis here. Um, 
in the X apostrophe direction. So if your mode is polarized also in the X, so if your TE e mode is polarized in the same direction as um, X apostrophe, you'll expect slightly different energy for that compared to a, a mode that's TM polarized and polarized perpendicular to this direction. And you have orientation two as well, um, where this Y direction, this propagation direction is aligned with uh, the slow axis, Y apostrophe. Uh, it may not be clear why this is important, but when you look at the dispersions, it does become important. So all you need to take away from that essentially is that if you are propagating in the X direction uh, here, you get a, uh, sorry, if you're propagating the y, y apostrophe direction here, you get a dispersion like this. So this is for orientation two. Um, it's typical dispersion with TETM splitting and that TETM splitting follows that delta E is proportional to K squared rule, large splitting up here, small splitting down here. But if you have polaritons propagating um, in the X apostrophe direction, you get a, this strange crossing of these TETM modes due to this, the fact that um, depending on how the polarizations are aligned with these axes, but you get this crossing. So you get this red TE mode, but that then crosses over the blue TM mode and becomes a lower energy mode at low angles. And at this crossing point, you expect this zero splitting. Um, and that's important for the uh, measurements we do. And we'll, we'll sort of talk about that shortly. Um, but we, we had to take it into account because if we were trying to observe something around here, the, the splitting would be different compared to if we were trying to observe it with a sample orientated 90 degrees. And this is just a, a plot of the, how the TETM splitting varies for each orientation. So it's this parabolic um, E is dependent on K squared uh, again. So... I'll just go over our excitation scheme. It was relatively simple. Um, we just impart the laser on our sample. We worked in tran transmission configuration, so we're actually hitting the back of the sample and leakage is coming out the front, but this is just a simplified view. You hit at some angle because the angle you excite at is corresponds to the wave vector you um, are exciting on the dispersion. So um, the higher the angle, um, the higher the wave vector. You then have the propagation of the polaritons in this Y direction here, and you expect to see these oscillations there. Um, on the dispersion, you can see we, we select a region. So say we select this region here, we simply have to tune the energy of the laser and then make sure we're exciting at the right angle, which corresponds to the wave vector. We can change the angle by just moving the laser across the excitation objective. Um, the closer the edge of the lens you are, the higher the angle. But we also have to be careful that we um, we select the right region. We have limits on the region we have because if we go too low and the energy splitting is low, uh, then we expect a very large, because it's inverse proportional um, relationship, we expect a very large um, period and too large for us to observe. So we can't go too low where the energy splitting is really low because we won't be able to see any oscillations or the oscillations will be there, but it will be larger than the propagation path. But we also can't go too high because if we go too high where we expect to see smaller oscillations with a larger energy splitting. Um, we start to hit the edge of the lens, we get distortion um, and the, you know, you can't, the, the spot becomes deformed, the laser spot on the sample. Um, and we also set the polarization to circular because this inherently arises due to this, uh, it's a two, two um, band effect. We wanna make sure we're exciting both bands equally because um, they're orthogonally polarized we use circular polarization. We could use diagonal, but we decided to use circular. Um, and this is what it would look like typically. So this is a real space image. This is actually an image of the emission. Our laser's down here. We're propagating in the Y direction. Um, and we're coming in at some angle on this dispersion with the energy tuned as well. Um, and you can see there's this exponential decay of intensity as we go up, but we can analyze this um, propagation path um, using this equation here. So I like to think of it as a center of intensity, like a center of mass, but for intensity. But all you're doing is you're taking slices um, for each Y value um, and you're um, sort of integrating over those slices and then dividing it by the total intensity of that slice. And you get the center of intensity. Um, and you can then plot for each value of Y, you can plot a point 
uh, which is output from this equation here. And hopefully you should see these oscillations along that path. So that is the experiment. That is what we, um, that's how we're going to observe these oscillations. Um, obviously we wanted to compare that to some theory. So our colleagues at uh, ITMO University ran some numerical simulations on this. Now I'm not a theorist, so I'm not too clued up on this, but they uh, numerically solved the time evolution of the, the spinner field. Um, and they created a simulation of what we just saw on the last slide in real space. Um, but in this case, the, the axes are slightly different. So it looks different, but um, the, the scale is different on the axes, but it's essentially the same thing. And they use this equation again uh, in this propagation here. And what they saw was this um, oscillatory behavior of this uh, center of intensity as it propagated in Y. So we then just had to give them the parameters of our sample, which we discussed before, the TETM splitting, the, the uh, biofringence, and they could take all that into account and also the pumping scheme of our specific case. And then we could have numerical simulations that we can directly compare to our experimental results. So bringing all that together, we can start to look at some of the results we got. Um, so for the first case, when there's no crossing of the dispersion, so it's that simple, nice, split energy bands, that e, uh, delta E is proportional to K squared uh, relationship. Um, we, we did that, use that equation to um, plot these points in blue here. Um, we have propagation in the Y direction. We're exciting at eight degrees on the dispersion. So that's a lower wave vector than this, this one over here. Um, and what we saw was this clear oscillation in the, the so remember these particles that are only initially given, these flowers are only initially given a, a, a Y sort of a, a momentum in Y. So this um, sort of counterintuitive X um, translation is what we would say is it's a very good. Um, and then obviously the numerical simulations are quite nicely uh, closely aligned with that. These larger area bar, error, error bars at the top here, um, uh, just because we have this exponential decay, so it becomes more undetermined. But you can see here, we then excited at 12 degrees. Um, so we're further up that dispersion now into the regions with larger energy splitting. And because we expect that inversely proportional relationship, we then see um, a smaller period, which was very nice for us to see, because it was in agreement with um, what said of, said of and predicted in there. And again, the numerical simulations have a nice agreement there. Um, yeah, so this, decre de this decrease in the period is due to the larger energy splitting. Um, and then we can go to the second case, more complicated case, where we study um, the dis we study it for the dispersion where there's this crossing. So the sample has simply been already, uh, sorry, rotated by 90 degrees and you have this slow axis, fast axis, uh, birefringent splitting. Um, so you get this crossing of the dispersion at roughly six degrees on the um, dispersion, a relatively low wave vector, but slap bang in the middle of the sort of region we want to be able to observe is to be very on that dispersion because of that lower and upper limit. Um, and it does slightly complicate the results, um, but it also agrees with kind of the theoretical predictions. Because you've got this uh, uh, crossing at six degrees where there's zero splitting, the regions around that, so above and below it, have a, you know, well, relative to this, wildly varying degree of splitting. They rapidly sort of approach zero and, and afterwards um, away from zero. So it's quite hard to be exact. Um, that's why we see this sort of um, slightly less good agreement between the numerical simulations, because experimentally it's hard to be exact on that spot and it's constantly changing splitting. Um, it's quite a complex relationship, but you know we saw a larger period than previously at eight degrees. So we're very close to that region, but it's a much larger period um, because the splitting is different because we're approaching that crossing point. And at ten degrees, we also saw a, a larger splitting. So a small, uh, sorry, at ten degrees, we saw a smaller period um, compared to eight point five degrees, which confirms that inversely proportional relationship. But also. Um, you know, it, they're different for similar regions compared to the last slide where there was no crossing, which further confirms that this energy splitting 
is influential on this this values of this period. Um, so you know, we saw these nice oscillations. We were confident there's it's Bewegung. Um, you know, it's clear there's some sort of transverse displacement of the particles, even though they're not given any sort of initial momentum in that direction. Um, but we wanted to take it a step further, partly because of a paper that was written by a previous postdoc on something fairly unrelated, but he looked at the, um, the magnetic field around the um, Dirac points of a photonic lattice, which I'll talk about in a second, and predicted that Zitter Vagan would be present. Um, so we took it onto lattices. So just very quickly, I'll talk about these lattices. Um, essentially, what we can do is we can etch down into that top DBR layer of a microcavity to create, uh, if you want to create a single micropillar, um, which is also known as a photonic atom. We can then overlap those micropillars to create a potential barrier between the two, but that allows photonic modes to hop between sites. And if you put that in a large array, you can create um, what we call a photonic lattice. So in this case, it's a honeycomb lattice. Um, and it introduces an in-plane potential that allows for the modulation of many different band structures. So for this honeycomb lattice here, um, we would expect to see uh, dispersion similar to that of graphene, which is exactly what you see. You have these P bands, you have these S bands, you have the Dirac points um, here and here. Um, so that's what a photonic lattice is. Why we use that photonic lattice for this experiment um, will become clear now. So we use a honeycomb lattice. Um, and within these sub, these sub bands, these P and S bands, you again get TETM splitting. Slightly different mechanism. It's due to tunneling between within that potential barrier. You know, I won't go into detail, but it acts to split the dispersion between two uh, into two separate bands again. But it gives us regions with a significantly varying splitting. So you can see here we get a small splitting. Here we get a large splitting. So we're no longer bound by that upper limit of, you know, you're hitting the edge of the lens, you get distortion. We can sort of directly compare at very similar regions. And we can also compare between the P and the S bands where the splitting is different as well. So I'm going to show you two, two uh, sets of results on the next slide. Um, we can remain at relatively low wave vectors of low angle and avoiding that distortion, but also have a splitting that allows us to resolve small period oscillations. So we excited in the P-band, where that black um, spot is there roughly, and also the S-band uh, where this red spot is here. So we're at the same wave vector, just a different energy, and the splitting is different between these two positions on the dispersion. Um, and the results look like this. Um, so we see this oscillation um, in the X direction when we're propagating in the Y direction as before and this is on the p-band where the splitting is uh, smaller so we get a large period and then we go go to the s-band we again see this um oscillations quite clear here um but in this case is a smaller period because the energy the energy splitting at the same wave vector in the s-band is larger so we you know really confirm that and dependency that inverse dependency and now we're very confident this was it a bevagon um, and again, we see this sort of uh, a good agreement with these numerical simulations performed here. It's, again, because it's quite a rapidly changing splitting on these, they're not necessarily in good agreement as the previous planner results, but um, you know, we, we, we were happy with them. Um, so that's really all I'm going to talk about today. I'll just sort of summarise it in some future directions some other parts of polariton physics, um, but we observe this it's vagum in um, with amplitude and period, that should say they're in agreement with modeling. Um, we also um, affirm that these microcavities provide an excellent platform for studying sort of these high energy physics analogs, physics analogs, you know, this would have previously been experimental, um, inaccessible or very hard and indirect observations, but we, you know, relatively simple measurements, relatively simple experiments, and we were able to observe this. Um, but future directions, obviously, clear future direction is introduce more exotonic polaritons, you have nonlinear effects, also the period and amplitude, and we can also see how uh, magnetic response 
um, affects that as well. Linking some of the work we're doing now, so we're currently working on um, analog black holes. It'd be nice to combine maybe two analog effects. So, for example, what would happen if you had polaritons propagating near one of these analog black holes? So maybe if you use a probe beam or something and a pump beam, you know, would it affect the dissipating period of amplitude? So that's something I would like to explore when we're involved in these um, analog black hole experiments we're currently working on. Um, and then if there's anything else you'd like to read about this, then you can read our paper here, um, recently published, uh, Light Science Applications. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, and thank you for listening.